Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is unveiling Africa's wildest plant and animal mysteries. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Lorraine Doyle. Lorraine, thank you so much for being here. This sounds like a fun topic. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thanks so much, Sunny. Um, and yeah, um, it's really cool to actually be here in Boulder. Um, so I'm doing this. I'm doing this presentation from the NatHab offices. Um, so it is quite busy today. Um, so you may um, experience some background noise um, of people chatting. Um, I've sort of tried to um, filter it out as much as I can, um, but yeah, perhaps just um, maybe bear with me a little bit. Um, so in terms of the topic of unveiling animal and plant mysteries, um, I think one of the things from when I was as young as I can remember, um, my question for everything was, well, why? Why are things the way they are? Um, and that is something that science um, has been asking, um, you know, for millennia. Um, and just one example of that, which is not um, an animal or plant related one, but, <coughs> sorry, um, was the orbit or, or the existence the existence of Pluto as a planet was actually um, calculated mathematically long before it was actually seen. And it was because somebody asked why there were perturbations in the orbit of Neptune. And when they sat down and did mathematical calculations, they found that there had to be another body influencing that orbit and whilst they couldn't see it they actually knew there was something there um, and i think that's the whole voyage of scientific discovery so just starting now um, with the animal on the screen which um, is um, a, a birchels or in southern africa now a plains zebra i mean one of the first questions that i think people on any safari might ask as well, why do zebras have black and white stripes? I mean, it's clearly not camouflage. It does not make them blend into a green and golden background. <clears throat> and there have been many, many hypotheses um, over the years. And that's something always to be very aware of when we're looking at um, decoding things as far as animals and plants go. Um, we can really only hypothesize um, and come up with the best or the most reasonable hypothesis um, with the information we have at the time, because we can't ask the zebra or the plant. Um, and so there's definitely, obviously, a level of supposition. Um, and we have to accept that as more information becomes available to us over time, um, those things or reasons may well change. Um, and so there have been numerous hypotheses, as I said, about striped zebra. One is, is that because they're a herd animal, when they're running together, um, it makes it more difficult for a predator to um, point or hone on in on a single one. Um, and that's possibly part of it. Um, and again, not only one of the above may apply, several may, but one of the most interesting ones of recent years has been that, um, and it was actually first studied um, or brought to the fore by um, a professor from the University of Toronto. <clears throat> and what he found was that biting flies like tsetse flies um, which are prevalent in areas where animals like zebras live um, for reasons which to date we still don't really understand do not land on black and white surfaces um, 
Now, you may ask yourself the question, well, if that's the case, why is every animal that lives in those regions not black and white? Um, and potentially part of the reason is, is that um, zebra skin is actually quite thin in terms of the hair layer that they have. Um, and they really do suffer a lot from biting flies. Um, this professor was so invested in his hypothesis that um, he actually undertook wearing different colors of, um, for better, want of a better expression, onesies, um, to see what would happen. Um, and to his amazement, um, the ones that were black and white um, were avoided the most by um, biting flies. So it seems like quite a reasonable hypothesis. And actually, um, people who own horses now, will, you'll find that a lot of horse blankets are striped black and white. And part of that is because it seems to deter these biting flies. So you solve one question or potentially solve one question, and you find yourself asking another. Um, and that is what's so great about the natural world. Um, so that's the story of um, our beautiful black and white striped zebra. Now I'm just going to see if I can get my, my screen is not being very cooperative with me here. Forgive me a moment. Okay, why are we not moving? Let's try that. Okay, so I think uh, many of you will know who I am. So this was just taken with some of my amazing colleagues um, on safari um, this year, um, just past um, at Madikwe Safari Lodge. Um, really, really cool people. So the word dagger boy, um, some of you who've been on safari um, will doubtless have been told this um, before. Um, but for those of you who haven't, um, it's a very specific term that um, applies to old male buffaloes, um, sort of um, animals that look a little like this. I always say to guests um, that they look they look at you as though you owe them money and they're coming to collect. Um, and this one, yeah, was giving us quite a serious stare down here um, with all his passengers, which are red-billed ox pickers, um, on his back. Um, so why would we want to call this animal by something very specific, like a dagger boy? Um, and I mean, I'll just pay to a couple or just scroll through a couple of pictures as I talk. So one of the reasons is, um, the word dagger is a Zulu word um, and it means mud. And what happens is when these big buffalo bulls get old, um, they can't keep up with the rest of the herd. Um, they become redundant to the herd because they pass their breeding prime. Um, their teeth have been ground down um, their molars by constantly chewing on grass. Um, you know, potentially with soil on it. So their teeth are worn um, and their skin has become really quite thin. Um, you can see a little bit on the face of this one. Um, so you can see areas where there's actually quite a lot of hair that is missing, which again makes them really susceptible to biting flies. You can also see a little bit in this picture on that bottom jaw um, that this buffalo is missing a lot of its teeth. And so what happens is these old bulls will migrate, for want of a better word, to areas close to water. Um, so like the previous picture, um, in amongst the reeds, access to water, um, the food is generally softer. Um, and so what they then do is to protect themselves from the sun um, where they have bald patches and also from insects and things that bite them and so on, um, they do this. So what they do is they land up coating themselves um, prolifically in mud um, from head to foot. And hence the name Dugger Boy, um, meaning mud, mud boy. 
Um, and again, um, and I may have alluded to this in other seminars or webinars, that these particularly bulls that are completely solitary, um, they are the most dangerous animal, in my opinion, in the African bush. Um, groups of three or four, still dangerous, but possibly less so. And the reason for this is, is that these guys are normally part of a herd. So they have a herd mentality. And once they've lost that protection of the herd, now the best form of defense is attack. And um, they're grumpy, they're old, they've got aches and pains. Um, they're not necessarily in the best of humors. And so if disturbed, um, they are very, very quick um, to go on the offensive, um, which is one of the reasons um, that they are really considered and actually and are um, particularly dangerous. Um, but that's how they got the name um, of Dugger Boy. Um, and as you can see from this picture, um, it's pretty it's pretty accurate. Um, this is just one. Um, it's got a beautiful set of horns there, um, having a, a chew on a piece of grass. Um, so remarkable animals, um, but again, you can see how tattered and torn his ears are. Um, so he's definitely got some age on him. So sometimes you'll see or hear expressions um, that have no scientific basis to them um, in terms of or obvious practical um, reason for the name. So Dugger Boy is an obvious practical reason for it. These things roll in mud. Um, but one of the ones that has always interested me was the one um, called the antelope of the sun. And the antelope of the sun is actually this animal, um, which is, um, an, it's called an earlunt. Um, which is spelled E-L-A-N-D, um, comes from an Afrikaans pronunciation where D is pronounced almost as a T. Um, and these are normally um, really desert adapted animals, um, often found up in areas like the Kalahari Desert, dry, sandy areas. And if we look back in history, the sand people um, often... Um, or previously referred to as the Bushmen, um, as they were pushed out of the more fertile land um, in Southern Africa by tribes moving down from the north, they were pushed out into these areas um, that were much hotter and drier and um, encountered this huge antelope. Um, and legend has it, that the first animal created by this, the sand trickster deity, who was known as Kachen, um, and the one which remained his favorite was the Irland. So what's really interesting is if you ever see rock paintings, rock art in Southern Africa, um, one of the animals that is featured most extensively um, is the Irland. Um, and it's also used extensively in shamanic rituals um, because their belief was that it had um, some mystic potency. Um, and the way that it got um, harnessed was these um, sand shamans would harness the supernatural energy um, in Ireland, fat and sweat to enable them to undertake the dangerous journey to the spirit world um, where they would need to fight off evil spirits. And the other story, and this is the one as to how it got its name as the antelope of the sun, um, was that it is credited as being the animal who returned the sun from the underworld back to the sky um, after it had been stolen by the great cannibal goddess of darkness. And I just think those kind of stories are just so um, incredible because, you know, you think about people who had no access to anything that had any 
form in science. Um, and for them, these animals whom they respected hugely um, told all of these stories for them. And unfortunately, um, many of those stories have been lost. There are not many that remain with us. Um, and so those that do um, are really important ones. Um, so these they're very, very shy antelope. Um, and it's the second largest of our antelope. Um, 900 kilograms, I'm not exactly sure what that is in pounds, um, but this is actually the original cow that jumped over the moon as well. So they actually are um, able to jump over fences, um, and I've seen this with my own eyes. Um, you'll have a six or seven foot fence, and this incredibly large animal will just jump straight over it. Um, so perhaps some of that as well um, gave um, or lent itself to this idea of its mystic potency, um, you know, that it could be this enormous animal, which as well as potentially providing food and so on, could also um, perform, you know, these seemingly um, quite Im improbable feats, if you will. Um, so here's a couple more. Um, very rarely seen, unfortunately. Um, as I said, extremely shy, will generally run away um, as you um, approach them. Um, but yeah, very special um, to view uh, when, when you do. Um, so these photographs were actually taken on the natural habitat trip a number of years ago um, in Zimbabwe at Mana Pools, which yeah, is one of the places um, that you can um, still see them. So again, um, another word, this one derived from um, the Zulu language as well, called Mbuvu. Um, and Mbuvu refers to this animal, um, the hippopotamus. And it literally translates um, as the mixed up animal. So it comes from the idea of um, when you put a bunch of things into a container and mix them up, um, it becomes this whole mixed up mess. And for local people, they were of the opinion that this creature couldn't actually make up its mind what it was. So Kreda Mutwa, who was um, quite a prolific um, African writer, um, said it behaves like a crocodile, but it looks like a mixture of a rhinoceros and an elephant, um, which is in many ways true, hence the fact that it's confused. Um, and of course, whilst that is legend, um, they are incredibly unusual animals. So they are terrestrial, um, meaning that they certainly can live on land. Um, they are not purely aquatic, um, but their closest relatives are actually whales. Um, so they um, are a herbivore. They are exclusively herbivorous. They only eat, eat grass. Um, and yet they have these um, large tusks, which claim no part in feeding whatsoever. Um, they are used purely as weapons. Um, and so these are some of the things that came to make people go, well, make local people think, well, you know, these animals are, are clearly um, incredibly mixed up. Um, and so the other kind of distinctive characteristic of hippos, if you've seen them, um, is what is known as their, sometimes people will say they sweat blood. Um, they don't actually sweat blood at all. Um, and what they produce, which is a pinkish secretion, is neither blood nor sweat. So it comes from glands that are much deeper than normal sweat glands. Um, and essentially what it does is it combines a sunscreen um, and um, a sun blocking property. So their skin, hippo skin, is about seven times more sensitive than other mammals. 
And so they're highly sensitive to sun. Um, and so what we also know about these compounds that give this reddish orange coloration is that they have antibiotic properties. And that's quite important when you have males that fight and, and do quite serious harm to each other, um, that they have almost like an onboard um, antibiotic. So here you can see one, this was a particularly cool day and um, this one was lying out in the sun. And one of the interesting things you'll see, um, maybe not as easily from this picture, maybe from no, not that one, but um, a hippo's nose, its eyes and its nostrils are all on the same level. Um, and so what that does is it actually allows them to lie pretty much completely submerged in the water with just their eyes, nose and ears above um, so that they don't have to expose themselves to this incredibly um, hot African sun, which now, um, you know, is going to burn their skin. So the other thing about hippos that most um, people would agree would consider them to be mixed up is they are an animal which spends at least 50% of its life in water, but it cannot swim. So um, this one also looking a little bit like, I think we potentially owe him money, um, was going down into the water. And um, uh, this one was, unfortunately his tusks are really, they're broken off um, as you can see from this. But it seems really bizarre that something that lives in water like this cannot swim. Also, given that they're quite closely related to um, whales. Um, and what they can do, however, um, is because of their um, incredible body mass, um, they literally bounce along on the bottom um, of water sources. So they can't survive in extremely deep water areas. Um, they need areas that are relatively shallow, um, such that they will be able to um, stand on the bottom. Um, so just to give you an idea of the strangeness of these tusks in a strict herbivore, um, they have a, a bite power of about 2,000 um, pounds per square inch. So if you compare that to an, an, uh, an adult humans, uh, we come in at a measly 250 PSI. Um, so very much not an animal to be trifled with. Um, and even if it may be confused or mixed up, um, possibly not a good idea to mention this to it. So something else, and I know this is um, a, somewhat of an oxymoron and commonly common, but this antelope, which is um, an impala, is incredibly common. Um, anyone who's been on a safari, um, certainly to Southern Africa, um, will tell you that they are literally everywhere. Wherever you turn, you're probably going to see an impala. And because of that, we tend to completely overlook them in many, many ways. Um, they're so common that we don't see them. And often when I'm looking for um, pictures of them to do presentations, I find that I actually have, despite how many hundreds, if not thousands I've seen, I don't have many photographs of them. Um, like you're always going to take one because you know you're going to see, you know, 10 more and then you never do. But actually, they um, are incredibly unique creatures. And one needs to ask the question, well, why are they so common? So there is something about them that is clearly making them incredibly successful, um, which is why they are so common. Um, and fossil evidence shows us them, that modern impalas have remained practically unchanged since the Miocene epoch, which is about 6.5 million years ago. Um, and if you think about that, that's an incredible endorsement for their original body morphology, that no further adaptations were really necessary for them um, to survive in, in their environment. If you take things like um, 
wildebeest, um, they've split into new species at least 18 times since they evolved from common ancestor. So it's really an endorsement, as I said, for these animals, um, you know, design, if you will. Um, so the other thing about them that um, makes them very, very successful is that they are both, they're what we call mixed feeders. Now, things like buffalo, for example, um, are strict grazers. So they cannot eat uh, woody material. So anything that has a broad leaf on it that is not a grass is not going to um, sustain a buffalo. They cannot digest it um, and they cannot feed on it. But one of the things that makes impalas so successful is that they can. They can eat both grass and browse. And as a result of that, if you look at um, the challenges that occur through seasons um, in the African savanna in terms of food availability, that gives you an enormous advantage um, over other animals that can't do this um, if you're able to do it. Um, so this was just a particularly nice um, photo of just with the, so only the rams have horns like this. Um, and another thing that has made them successful is that they have this defined rutting season. Um, and that starts as our days start to get shorter and towards our winter, so in May every year. And so all mating takes place in a very, very short period of time. And what that means, um, so that's a female, um, what that means is that all of these little um, chaps land up being born usually within about a maximum of six weeks of each other. So it's a strategy that's not very um, glamorously called flooding the market. But what it means is, is that clearly this is a very good food source for predators. But if you have so many young born all at the same time, well, it's impossible for predators to eat all of them. And so despite the fact that they are on everything's menu, um, and many of them are preyed upon early on, because of the strategy, they are still able to increase their numbers um, and remain abundant uh, because of the strategy. So a lot of things that have gone into making them this successful, um, and we just overlook them because there's one around every corner. Um, so again, well, why are they so successful? Well, why are there so many? Starts to unpack um, other questions, um, you know, very often with interesting, interesting answers. Um, nodding off. So we used to talk about when um, I was doing quite a lot of lecturing, we would talk about what we call the wildebeest shift. And the wildebeest shift was the one that happened straight after lunch because everybody was nodding off to sleep. Um, because wildebeest, and these are blue wildebeest, um, have this habit of nodding, nodding their heads up and down. Um, and sorry, this one is probably, it's not, it's a little bit gross, I guess. But what happens is flies called bot flies lay their eggs on grass. The wildebeest eat the grass and they pick up the bot flies' eggs in their nose. So those eggs hatch, the larvae migrate through the nasal cavity um, and the sinuses. And once they've completed their growing phase, they migrate back to the nasal cavity where they're sneezed out. Um, and obviously, this causes as you can imagine, having something crawling around in your nose, um, a fair amount of irritation. And it's one of the reasons that they have this constant habit of nodding their heads up and down. Um, and it's basically due to the irritation of these bot flies um, in their nose. So is this a harmless relationship? Does it harm the wildebeest? Not always. But it can. Um, 
And so it can create lesions um, in the brain, sometimes in the eyes or the sinuses. Um, so it can cause illnesses, um, but not always. Um, so it's not a purely parasitic relationship, um, but it certainly does have a positive effect for the box fly. It completes its life cycle, but not so much for the wildebeest. Um, so yeah, as you can see there, um, this is your, you know, the kind of very long nose um, of your of your wildebeest. Um, and Shane, he's probably got bot flies up his nose at um, any particular time of looking at him. Just another interesting thing about them is they, another name for them is brindled gnu. Um, and that's a name that was given to them, or well, the name gnu was the name given to them by the sand people um, because they said it was the sound that they make. Um, so they have this kind of gnu, gnu type sound, um, which again, possibly related to the fact that they sneeze, they have a sort of snuffled sneeze quite a lot. Again, possibly trying to dislodge these spot flies in their noses. Rotting meat, question mark. So sometimes you may find yourself um, in the African savannah walking past an area and thinking, my goodness, something died here. Um, but on closer inspection, what you may find is a plant that looks like this one. Um, and this plant is called um, Stapelia gigantea. Um, the common name that they refer to often as um, carrion flowers. And they have an absolutely incredible strategy. So if you look at this flower, it has very specific colors in it. It's yellow and or sort of yellowish and red, and it's extremely hairy. And it also smells like rotting meat. So what would be the reason for looking like this and smelling like this? And the best hypothesis we can come up with, and obviously this has been you know, well documented and observed, is this actually looks quite a lot like a carcass. So a carcass will obviously have hair on it, there'll be blood um, and muscle tissue. Combined with the smell, um, it's quite likely to appeal to flies. And as a result, flies will then visit the plant um, and act as its pollinator. Um, and very cooperatively on the days I was taking these photographs, um, lo and behold, um, a fly turned up. So we generally think of, um, uh, and they are the main pollinators of most things are bees, but flies are actually um, pollinators of many things. Um, there are other trees um, in South Africa that during the flowering season smell like stinky socks, um, uh, cluster leaves, they're called, and they are also fly pollinated. Um, and one that supply, often surprises quite a lot of people is every time you um, bite down on your chocolate bar, um, cocoa plants, um, cocoa flowers are pollinated by flies. So, but for me, just the absolute um, jizz, so the kind of um, general impression of this plant or this flower um, is really so like that of potential carcass um, that it's almost like this carrion plant has, if you will, gone the extra mile um, in attracting um, its preferred um, pollinator. So um, in contrast to this, there are some things um, and in particular, this um, beautiful puff adder, um, which is one of Southern Africa's um, venomous snakes. It's, it is a viper. Um, but what is truly remarkable um, about puff adders is um, they are what we call stealth predators. So as you can see from this picture, it's kind of very what we would call cryptically colored. So it's very similar in shade um, and coloration 
to the leaf litter that's around it. Um, and there's a reason for this. Um, and that is because they are these stealth predators um, and or ambush foragers. And so what that means is, unlike other snakes, for example, like a black mamba, which are active foragers, um, these guys lie in wait and they wait for something to go past. Um, and then they will grab it and eat it. Now, um, a, a good friend of mine, um, Professor Graham Alexander, um, says that for many, many years, he would sit and go, why is this like it is? He said, because, okay, so visually they hide themselves, but everything has an intrinsic odor. It's, we all have our own scent. So surely things that have very strong or very good senses of smell, like rodents, will smell this passata. And so it's going to lose so many of its meals. And so what they started, what Graham started to do in his laboratory at the University of the Vedratisrand in Johannesburg, is they started to look at, okay, well, let's see, do these animals actually have an intrinsic smell? And so what they did was they took a number of different snakes and they let the snakes um, go over um, cloth that was left out. And then what they did was they introduced sniffer dogs originally and, and allowed the sniffer dogs to sniff where these um, various snakes had been. And on every single occasion, um, the dogs could not detect the one where Pafana had been. Um, so, sorry, I omitted a stage there. They would hide these cloths. So they would hide them, um, you know, in a number of different locations. And without fail, the dogs would find every single one of these cloths, except the one that had been crawled over by the puffer. So, they said, okay, well, that's dogs. You know, this is not a natural interaction. Um, dogs and puff adders, you know, they don't really live in the same environment. So they said, okay, well, let's take something um, like a meerkat. Um, so those are the little creatures that live in the Kalahari Desert, well known for their incredible sense of smell. And they repeated the experiment. And lo and behold, same story, same outcome found every other one, could not find Pafara. So then they went one step and they said, okay, deal breaker, let's give it to a mammal that has the most pronounced sense of smell that we know of at this point, which is um, an elephant, an African elephant, and exactly the same outcome. And so at the end of that, what they deduced, um, and the term that Graham um, coined for it is uh, was chemical crypsis, was that if you are a stealth predator like this, it is not enough to only be camouflaged in um, what you look like. You have to have chemical crypsis, which means, in this instance, that you have no intrinsic odor. Um, and so you can lie in wait, um, hidden, and you are not going to be seen or smelt. Um, and so there's been much more work on going now to say, well, is this the case for all of these types of um, ambush predators? Um, and that's work that's ongoing. But um, again, it just comes from, well, why is this the way that it is? Um, and this research is not, um, I mean, it's over, it's over a decade old now, but, you know, it's not back in the, in the ancient history that this was discovered. Um, so for a long time, people have just been going, well, they, people can't, you know, animals can't see them. Um, but thinking about, well, could they smell them? Um, brought about this whole um, other set of, wow, these animals are you know, incredibly well adapted to their environment, so much so um, that they have no intrinsic odor. Um, so obviously the question is, is yes, well, when um, snakes def defecate because they are obviously large protein consumers, 
that has a very, very distinctive um, and very pungent odor. Um, and that is definitely the case. Um, but often what will happen with these um, uh, ambush predators is that they will retain those feces until such time as they shed their skin, which is an, in and of itself um, can become a, a bit of a smelly process. And so they do that whole um, event, if you will, at once, um, and then we'll obviously vacate that area. Um, so, yeah, um, a very, very clever strategy. Um, this was just some other photographs. Um, I know that snakes are not something that people generally are particularly inspired by, um, but they really are truly extraordinary creatures. Um, and in this case, I think incredibly beautiful. Um, so related to your pit vipers here in North America, but not that closely, um, ours don't have um, infrared pits on them like uh, yours do. Oh, and here was just another one. And so you can see again that those tones, you know, that allow it, um, if there was a little more vegetation there, it would be very um, cryptically disguised. Um, so eat me if you dare. Right. So color um, in many creatures, like birds, for example, is used as a display mechanism to attract a mate. Um, However, amongst arthropods and insects, um, it has a very different meaning. And in the case, so this is a millipede. Um, this was taken on a rotting log um, just outside my house. Um, to give you an idea, it's not particularly large. Um, it's probably as long as my middle finger. So I know it looks quite giant there. But this bright red, and you'll think, well, you're living in an environment which is quite dull. And why are you standing out like this? Is it to attract a mate? But it's making you very vulnerable to being eaten. Similarly, this um, is called a blister beetle. Um, bright yellow, black, um, you know, really quite prevalent, even on a flower of this color, but it stands out. Other ones like um, this, it's called an elegant grasshopper. Bright shades standing out in your face. Um, you know, like really, what, what benefit is there to this? Um, and our African monarch, um, also closely related to your monarch butterflies. Um, again, very brightly colored. Um, so what's the deal with all of this? So, what we have found with all of these animals that are brightly colored, arthropods and insects, is these are warning colorations. Um, we call it aposomatic coloration. Um, and it's usually a combination of red, yellow, black, sometimes white, um, alone or in combination. And essentially what it appears to be is a warning to anything that is likely to try and eat it. Try and eat me. I'm poisonous. You're not going to like it. Um, and so in the case of this millipede, um, it actually contains hydrogen cyanide, um, and which obviously make it um, extremely unpalatable. So you may have a situation where one does get eaten, um, but the likelihood of the animal that ate it, if it survives, eating a second one once it has had that very nasty experience is highly unlikely. Um, so in terms of blister beetles, they actually contain something called cantharidin. Um, and cantharidin causes really horrible blisters on your skin. Um, so anything that were to try and eat this or in any way attack it um, is going to find, uh, and it's a secretion. Um, so you don't, this one doesn't have to actually actively be bitten um, to, to get um, the animal exposed to the, the toxin. Um, I had one as a child um, crawl over my hand and I had big blisters on my hand for quite a few days, which were extremely painful. 
Um, so bright coloration, stay away. Yeah, I don't want to eat me. These guys, um, they actually also contain um, a, a toxin, which when they come under any form of attack, they actually secrete this froth. Um, and there's no other way to describe it from around their joints, um, which is highly noxious. And so, again, any exposure, try to eat it once. You know what? I'm black, yellow, red. I've got every color under the sun on me that tells me, leave me alone. Um, any self-respecting animal is going to do so. And then lastly, um, with monarchs, which I'm sure many of you will know already, um, they actually don't manufacture their own toxin. Um, so um, they contain cardioglycosides, which affect heart muscle functionality and things that try and eat them. But they actually absorb that toxin um, from um, milkweed plants when they are a larva. And what's really amazing about this is, is that the larva becomes toxic from the plant. It passes through the pupil stage when this creature goes into a cocoon and pretty much liquidates, li liquidizes, and then emerges as a butterfly. And the adult butterfly um, is also toxic, but it has not expended any energy in producing a toxin. So in nature, everything really, or a lot of things, are about conservation of energy. So if something is expensive to produce, um, it comes at a cost. If, for example, thinking about a snake, it bites something, releases venom, realizes this is not a prey item, it takes time for that venom to be reproduced or to reproduce. And so that was an expensive mistake because if it doesn't have sufficient venom to envenomate something that is prey, it's going to go hungry. Um, but what monarchs have done is they very effectively, in inverted um, commas, um, they have outsourced their toxicity or means of toxicity to a plant, um, which is yeah, pretty, pretty neat. But yes, if it's brightly colored, it's an insect, it's an arthropod, stay away. Um, it's probably toxic. Um, so all that glitters. So this is um, just a little bit about some very um, beautiful birds. Um, so this one is, oops, sorry. That one is a Cape Glossy Starling. Um, this one is a Violet-backed Starling. Um, this is one of our sunbirds. Um, I think this one's a Mariko sunbird. Um, kind of falls the same niche as your hummingbirds, but can't hover. Um, and then this is a little white-bellied uh, sunbird male. So what you will have noticed in all of these is that they have a very highly iridescent sheen um, to their coloration. And what is um, really interesting about this is that all that glitters is not pigment. Um, not, not gold in this case, but pigment nonetheless. So if you were to see this um, bird in poor light, um, equally this one, they would be incredibly drab. In fact, they probably look mainly black to you. Um, and the reason for that is, um, is that their feathers contain a structural pigment. Um, and so what happens is the keratin in the feather actually causes what we call tyndall scattering, um, which is why most of these iridescences um, tend to be in the sort of blue-green spectrum. Um, and so you have this um, light scattering um, when it's hitting this keratin, and as it is um, diffracting, it is giving you this um, incredible level of sheen. Um, so because the precise color 
um, can depend on your viewing angle, um, you sometimes, in many instances, you'll find this iridescence to them. So you'll get, you know, blue to green, um, orange to yellow. And again, this is purely because it involves reflection of light, not absorption. Um, and so these colors can just be quite incredible. Um, but take them out of that light and, and put them into a dull environment. Um, and you will find that all of these beautiful, um, what appear to be pigments or colorations in them, um, just disappear. Um, so again, you're not having to expend energy producing that pigment to give you this beautiful color, which in their case has got nothing to do with toxicity. It's got to do with attracting a mate, because it's very often the males that are much more colorful. Um, both male and female Cape Glossy Starlings are uh, this sort of color. Um, the female of um, this beautiful violet back starling is actually a very almost nondescript um, brown and um, yeah, brown and beige almost. Um, similarly with um, these are sunbirds um, and the male of the female of the white bellied is very drab. And so um, in this situation, to invest in producing lots and lots of um, beautiful pigments, you know, to attract a mate would be expensive in terms of energy. Well, amazingly, the keratin and the feathers in these specific animals allows for the refraction of light or reflection of light to give them their beautiful colors. So I think that's my time almost up. Um, the only other thing I'll say, and the reason I chose a lion at the end was because, um, and I'm sure most of you already know this, but lions are the only truly social cat. Um, and for anyone who's got a domestic cat at home who thought that the particular kitty cat was lonely and brought in another cat, would have probably found that there was quite a nasty cat fight. <laughs> um, and that is because most cats are solitary. So if you think of your leopards, your jaguars, any of your big cats, um, even cheetahs, um, apart from a mother and cubs, um, they live a solitary existence. Um, and so why did lions um, take the strategy of, you know, going into group living? Um, it is expensive in a way because you have to share your food. Um, and there are a number of different reasons for it, but one of them is, is that it certainly seems to help um, cub survival um, because you have uh, allo suckling or shared suckling of cubs. Um, you have the ability to take down potentially greater prey, um, and there is a certain amount of safety in numbers. Um, but it certainly is a very unusual strategy um, for a cat. So. That ends um, the webinar for today. Um, so, yeah, just to say thanks very much and back to you, Sunny. Lorraine, thank you. That was fascinating. So many cool tidbits about animals and plants. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, before we start the Q&A, I'd just like to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so this goes back to earlier in your webinar. Do you have any idea if black rhino have built-in antibiotics? Last week, one of our viewers saw a female that was a tad bit beaten up on the head um, and was just curious if they have that built-in antibiotic as well. Um, as far as I know, no. Um, the only, well, one of the few mammals that it's actually been um, kind of really researched in um, and has become quite obvious in is is hippos. So to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't um it doesn't happen in, in black rhinos or white rhinos for that matter. Hmm, interesting. Um, do African wild dogs also have more than one female that suckles the brood of pups? So Normally what happens is, um, I mean, only generally only the alpha female will actually breed, but um, 
And for most of the suckling process, um, it will be the alpha female. Sometimes there's what we know as a beta female who may have covers of her own, um, who may also suckle. But when it gets to the meat eating stage um, of the pup's life, then all of the pack contribute to the feeding of the pups. Um, so it's a very different thing from lions where the males will take the lion's share, then the females, then the cubs. Um, in wild dog society, um, once meat eating happens in these um, pups, is everybody will go out, consume um, meat from whatever they've killed, go back to the den and regurgitate for the pups. Um, so, but from a suckling point of view, um, it's normally the alpha female um, and occasionally the beta, a beta female that will help suckle. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, one of our viewers wants to point out that the American blue jay also has no blue pigment. It is just light refraction built into the feathers. Yeah. Very interesting. It's, yeah, it's an incredible strategy. Well, that's the last question we have. So I will turn it back to you for closing comments. Um, yeah, just to say um, thanks very much for listening. Um, also to say um, thanks to Natham. It's um, had a wonderful week here in Boulder. Um, it's been great to meet some of the staff um, here in the office. And um, yeah, I hope um, everyone has a great uh, festive season. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> thank you. And thanks again for bringing us such a fascinating presentation. I want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.